Welcome back, everyone, to TNO, the last season of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokulov, on which we can talk about the speech. The black uniform ranks stood assembled before tents, pacing Yezov. He saw the nervous energy in their eyes and fought to not meet it with his own, stealing himself, forcing his mind back into the familiarity and certainty of the past. To the gauntlet, and how he had been decisive and strong like Karabyshev, he'd, just, he'd just do a speech and forget about the fear. Comrade soldiers, Yazov began using that familiar phrase that Karbyshev had been so, so fond of. Today, by proving our strength, we prove our worthiness to rule Russia. Your deeds today will prove the fundamental nature of the universe. The strong rule and the weak perish. Your deeds will prove that we, the All-Russian Black League, are the sole salvation of this nation and its millennium of civilization. So, though today you may fight your own countrymen, fight as if you were f facing down the big old bad leader of Germany himself. Because if we fail today, there is no tomorrow, and Russia will perish once and for all at the hands of the superpowers when the great trial comes. So go forth, and carve your names into history. Yazov was satisfied with his delivery, and a cheer broke out, and now the final personal touch that was uniquely his, our cause is just, he shouted to the further cheers, giving voice once more to those words he had heard on the radio when it all began in 1941. The enemy will be destroyed, victory will be ours. The speech was over in what seemed like an instant, his words flowing from him without comprehension. As his heart soared, basking in the soldiers' cheers, as anxiety melted away for a moment, he wondered if this was how Karabyshev had felt before stepping into the unknown. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of all. We must get those German boys and destroy them. So, we finish up the focus tree over here. We focus the part of the focus tree over here. And let's go down with Shop and the Sword. Let us ready the shield. We do not, as yet, possess a sizable army. Our enemies can draw upon a much larger reserve of manpower and retain the bulk of the old West Siberian military. Though the Glav Korvark has faith in the offensive spirit of our cadres, a single misstep could see them take more casualties than we can afford to replace. Shoring up our existing defenses will help alleviate the damage from such an occurrence. Defense is always easier than attack. It will also open up the possibility of using attritional warfare to whittle down the superior numbers of our enemies in the event that they should bring the fight to us. In addition, we're going to go and do... Sharpen the sword. Before embarking on the first steps towards reunification, our soldiers need to be adequately prepared. The rifle must be oiled, the grenade primed, the bayonet sharpened, and the well reinforced with a spine of iron. To falter at the first blow would never live, and never live to see the great trial would be a humiliating failure and a betrayal of our founder's dream. The cadres will be deployed to the field and directed to begin drills immediately. When the time comes to strike, they shall attack as a single well-oiled machine rather than the fanatical, barely-armed rabble our reputation suggests they are. We now have to do with gods of the north. But let's just shore up defenses, shall we? Since the collapse of the Union, Omsk has always been a heavily fortified city. The bunkers and tunnels first built by the West Siberian People's Republic were only the foundation for the massive network of fortifications and redoubts constructed on the orders of Karabyshev. The paranoia of the Black League has taken physical form. The lines of fortified gun emplacements, trenches, minefields, stretch from the borders of the League all the way back to its heart in Omsk. The very landscape of Western Siberia has been weaponized against all outside intrusion. As Karabyshev's influence weakened, the squabbling generals of the Old Guard grew lax in the maintenance of these mighty fortifications. They only cared for the defenses that protected their personal holdings, thinking exclusively of themselves and not of Russia's needs. Only when Yazov vanquished the traitors did he realize the sorry state that the defenses were in. He had reunified the League in his territory, and now that he had consolidated his control, he would not lose it to an outside invader. As the League prepares for every war, every step has been taken to make sure that the home front is ready. The last trial has taught the Russian people that they must expect the war to come to them, and under the Black League's guidance, they will be ready if it does. The League has conscripted everyone within, from within its borders to restore the fortifications in and around Omsk. Trenches are deepened and reinforced. Old bunkers are cleaned out and refitted. Anti-air crews reposition their guns towards the border to counter an aerial opponent. As Russia's reclamation draws near, the anticipation in Omsk is palpable. The last weeks of preparation will decide Russia's fate. Yazov and the rest of the Black League refuses to cede a single inch of Russian soil to the enemy uncontested. The Black League must not fall until justice has been done. Or does, has been elected president of Mexico. Very, very good plan to God in. Once the Soviet Union appeared to to the west as a terrifying dragon out of myth, a great winged serpent that darkened Europe with a shadow of its wings and threatened to incinerate all that stood before it. Then the Germans came, driving the beast from its lair and claiming its riches for themselves. Its sole attempt to reclaim its home failed, and now the dragon of communism as a sickly old lizard just waiting for someone to put it out of its misery. The Black League is a questing hero, and its cadres of dragon slaying, sword clenched, and mailed fist. To the north dwell some of the last defenders of that failed ideology. Kaganovich and his assorted crew of old war dogs and career politicians. Their time has passed and their cause lost. We shall enlighten them to this fact. What do we have now? Ah, 
Build new schools, agricultural methods. Well, is anything else going down here? Besides poverty, poverty is, well, it is what it is. But equipment must go up, 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 up. Workers, expert, actually, expertise is going okay, right? Expertise is 3.5 a month. Uh, well, research facilities, schools, actually. I want one for everything here, so if we can do research facilities, I would not be opposed to that. Very, very good. The final preparations, though. Light is just beginning to creep over the eastern horizon. Andre had been awake for several hours already, watching the floor border for any sign of movement. Behind him were the rest of his cadre doing their morning drills, checking their weapons, and preparing for breakfast. Ahead of him stretched an endless grassland disappearing into the darkness. About 50 meters out into that grassland was an invisible line. The line that separated the all-Russian Black League from the traitors and cowards that sought to undermine Russia. Borders were a fluid and often a fanciful concept in Russia nowadays, but according to the map they had, the line was out there and they were not to cross it, not yet. Anyways. Technically, there was no plans for war with the Bolshevik scoundrels and Tiomen, and any talk of such was a rumor started by the men. Technically, Combat Cadre 154376, along with almost every other Combat Cadre in the League, has been moved to the border as part of the training exercise. Order to be combat ready at all times has nothing to do with the escalating border clashes between the League and the Communists of the North. Officially, everything was business as usual, but the simple fact that the Cadre commanders were making no effort to silence talk among the ranks of an invasion was enough proof for everyone. War was coming. Starting out into the pre-dawn darkness, Andre couldn't help but be excited. He knew that he shouldn't be, after all, it was his fellow Russians he would be going into battle against, but he had trained for war since he was 14. He would finally be able to serve his purpose for the League and avenge the Motherland. He did not want to fight for glory. Out there in the darkness, about 50 meters away, lay something far greater than glory. Redemption was waiting for him, and a line will be crossed. Ooh, take the black. Owns these guys. A pure League. Well, regardless, I'm going to go and re-expand the underground, because we will own it eventually. The dragon's new lair, carved out on Kaganovich's orders, runs deep beneath the cities taken by our cadres. Not dissimilar from our own, the communists apparently built this vast underground ne network of tunnels and bunkers to mitigate the effects of German bombings on their industry. In this, it would appear that they were somewhat successful. It seems that even communists know good ideas when they see them. Now that our tunnels and underground facilities are under our control, we shall continue with what their old owners began and dig even deeper. When the Great Trial comes, all the people of Russia will need all the security we can give them. We will not reject anything that furthers Russia's odds of survival, which is a good thing. So we get two off uh, civilian factories and obskets two building slots, which is pretty good. Uh, what do we have up here? Ah, uh, construction subsidies, if we want them. Do we want construction subsidies? 15% more construction speed. Uh, I don't think we can build here, can we? No, we still can't. God dang it. Is that... Uh, I'm going to say no. It's only 15% more, which is not bad. It's not great, but not bad. Resource extraction would mean absolutely nothing to maybe get maybe slightly one more steel and a slight oil that we don't really need right now. And I want to save up our political power because we only get 0.12 every day. Holy cow. So, yeah, that's not good. Now, honestly, I'm not too worried about this, as you can tell. Uh, Yeah, it doesn't seem too bad. Zotelis so provides advisors to XX, lots and lots of XXX, X, 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 interaction and military advising. Details, six officers have just arrived in quadruple X, hailing from Zotelis. As you requested, they have already begun to put to work in the barracks. We expect training to go smoothly, for the head merchant assured me that these advisors are the best of the best. One of them, Mr. XXXX, has participated in both wars. I have relayed to him Camp XXX for joint work with the general staff. In other news, another group of military experts is scheduled to arrive within the next week. They are deployed to be the Quadruple X Front, where they will provide tactical advice to forward units. <clears throat> Aside from supplementing the officer corps, these capable, ma capable men are knowledgeable on asymmetrical warfare, giving us the edge in combat. I highly recommend that we hire more advisors from the Zetals. Their, hel their help is appreciated. Very good. Uh, a couple of comments, though, I still need to address. Uh, before we do that, though, let's see. Someone recommends... Ooh, actually, for this one... Ooh. Does that really help? Nah, I'm not going to even do it, bother. Provides mercenaries. Earlier today, six companies were deployed to Quintiple X. Courtesy of Zotelis, the men participated in a brief skirmish on the border, inflicting disproportionate casualties on hostile forces. When questioned, the mercenaries confirmed having been organized in Zotelis itself, trained with the help of modern doctrines developed by the merchants. One of the com commissars noted, The soldiers deployed discipline in the face of mortal adversity, executed orders without question, and risked their lives in the service of our state. They acted more like professional soldiers than mere mercenaries. As agreed to, Zotelis has received our payment, but their head merchant also claimed that more business opportunities await us. The Mountain Republic has many more troops, which will be invaluable in turning the tide of war. They help us appreciate it. Wow. That's an I've never seen this before. Is this normal? Is this... Does the does the house actually send out soldiers to help? Because that doesn't seem normal to me. That really does not seem normal at all. Holy cow. Uh, regardless, someone recommends in the future campaigns, I do not bring up the, the Bogatir dude. You know, the uh, guy that might help out people. So, we'll see what happens. Um... 
Sorry, are we at war with yeah, two men? That's it. Not sure why they're all the way over there, but whatever. But yeah, I, at this point, I don't think I need to read about the Bogatir anymore, so. That's alright. We do have other. Okay, we run them over. I love running our enemies over. Man, it's such a shame that we don't have that much political power. Or political power gain, I should really say. I don't think we, we can, we're able to really beat these guys up, that's alright. Let's go straight there. Oh, yeah, you guys just go right on ahead. Seriously, just go right on ahead. It'd be super nice if we could. Good. Nice. I don't think you can really cut them off, but that's alright. Oh, we got something else here. Three. Military access? Uh, I don't think we need military access. I don't think that's going to be really super important, but that's, a, that's just me, maybe. Two men? Ah, Lenin's body captured. Our soldiers have seized Lenin's mausoleum. Due to the lack of strategic or tactical significance to Lenin's corpse, the troops of our opponent abandoned his body without a fight, choosing instead to retreat to a safer, more defensible position. The political significance of Lenin's body remains questionable. Across Russia, views over Lenin as a historical figure are wide range and varied. Many people view Lenin as a father of a political movement which has, through its stupidity and incompetence, led to the collapse of our nation. Others see Lenin as a bastion of a form of communism true to Marx and Engels, the legacy of which would be betrayed by Zare Bukharin. Others still see Lenin as the first in line of succession of a troubled yet still utopian Bukharinist leaders and thinkers. Whatever the thoughts of this man, he is most certainly one of the most prominent leaders in Russian history now he's in our grasp. Four decades of history in our hands. Is that enough for to kill them? No, we're going to need to kill these guys off too. Totally fine. We've actually done really well. A thousand, basically 2,000 versus 3,200. Uh, that's, that's pretty darn good. Scam for loot because I like loot. Leave him be. Well, no. Bury him quietly. Destroy the traitor. Um, I guess we can do that. Doesn't have to end personality. Bury the revolutionary. Huh. Okay, Lenin's mausoleum would be pretty nice. But I guess the only thing we can do is leave him be. Or bury him quietly. I want to get more political power, so. Bury him quietly. Help him out. Can we actually pierce these guys? No, we cannot. Which sucks, but whatever. Yeah, not much else here. Oh, we're running out of manpower because probably garrisons and such. Local police force? That lowers compliance. I want more compliance. Or to not get any penalties for compliance. But the Ural automotive plant has been captured. With Shelia Ch Benskin have conquered, our men sweep through the city in search of anything of value in the ongoing conflict with their neighbors. Reading teams zip across the streets, firing at the remnants of enemy divisions, holding out homes and buildings scattered across the urban sprawl, and crackles of gunfire echo throughout the streets from skirmishes a few blocks away. A unit of our men had besieged an encampment holding out in the Euro Automotive plant, and upon breaching enemy defenses, the plant was deprived from the few dozen men left clinging to their lives. With this now major manufacturing set under our control, our soldiers will now have greater access to off-road vehicles and later confrontations. This has great potential to improve our supply lines and aid in improving the speed of our reinforcements. The powerful engines produced in the Euro Automotive plant are renowned for their speed and dexterity over difficult terrain, and will definitely prove useful in our navigational and incursive efforts across the Russian anarchy. Truly, with the aid of the motor, this is a victory for our people and the future of Russia. Oh, I'm joining with my cat. Hey, Bink. You want my chair? All right. Here, have my chair. As we take out the West Siberian People's Republic. Be bink. Come on, take it. Ah, very good. Expand the underground. Ooh, what do we do here? Ah, uh, we gotta integrate them. That's right. Bink, take it. Take my chair. Uh, let's see. A pure league. Kind of. Hmm. Take the black. Ooh, the offer. I don't know. Do we want to be pure? I kind of want to go with a pure league just because we get more ultra national support. Oh. Let's go with a pure league. There's no room for the minions of a dead ideology. Amongst the ranks of the motherland's true sons, Kaganovich and his servants are traitors to a man, self serving wretches who solely the motherland by draping her in red. They have forsaken their right to serve her in battle. This is That is reserved for pure, true hearted Russians. They will die as they deserve. For some, that will be by bullet. For others, by the agony of the bayonet. For the lucky few, that means a lifetime of toil in the mines and factories that keep our war machine running. Deserve fates all. There can be no forgiveness for the red traitors. Ooh, there goes the Soviet Republic. Very nice. Very, very nice. Oh, we didn't want much here. Oh, bink, 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 bink. Alrighty, tidy. Well, we have nine divisions. They're not bad divisions. Oh, oh, I didn't realize Lotus is that close. I keep forgetting how close we are actually to the border. I am just worried about Novosibirsk, though. Because they are looking 
mighty thick, as some might say. A sanitation exercise, internal security director stat report, status, trader son. Note, all personnel class 5C and below are forbidden to access below information, disobedience is death. Summary, liquidation of dissident political elements, former former titles, Lazar Kaganovich, Nikita Khrushchev, Vyacheslav Molotov, Mikhail Kaganovich, wave 1 complete with minimal losses of time and manpower. Abstract, political element Kaganovich reported to the podium at, oh, 7.15 hours, 5 minutes ahead of schedule. Formal trial proceedings documented in full with the, within report Adidum A1 for access of class 7A personnel and above only. Elemental was permitted brief speech acting his own to self-defense. Charges of political interference approved with no objections. Transcript of speech as follows. Gosh darn you, darn you all. I know you're in there somewhere. Yazov, oh, why? I saw what you were doing, what you did to the to the city my people built. I saw the bands. I saw my people march into prisons and never come out. What monster would do this to set jackals on his own people? Elemental was taken into custody after being rendered incapable, or, yeah, incapable of speaking. Acting judge redacted. Approved extraordinary recess following speech. Recognized possible mental stress of element Kaganovich as reason for his hypocritical statements. And agreed to call clemency to political elements thereafter. All wave one candidates were barred from speaking to prevent themselves from further embarrassment and conviction and sentencing a process sentencing process ahead of schedule. Median time to liquidate 5.35 minutes. Beautiful. Ah, what do we have over here? Integration, of course, is always nice. Uh, support equipment. We could buy some support equipment. Uh, and I'll, I'll do actually this one. That's actually really good. Because we need more factories. We're looking pretty good on some stuff here, actually. Basic empty tanks. Working on motorized, sort of. Even early cast. Not even fighters, but cast. All right. All right. A pure league, and then a war plan bogatier. Beyond the red, or beyond the reds, stands the line of Siberia, Konstantin Rokokovsky. Rokosovsky and his pet military junta. He fancies himself a benevolent dictator, a brave knight who watches over the people of Sverdlovsk, offering protection in exchange for service. What false? He's a male general playing at kingship. We shall put an end to his pathetic fantasies and show his subjects the true path. Rokosovsky's, Rokosovsky's army will be a tough obstacle to overcome, but they're not invincible. Their main strength lies with their leadership. The common soldiers fight mostly for themselves, and their morale will crumble once the, the futility of their struggles become apparent. Drusler wins in Oslin. Oh, good for him. At this point, uh, we don't have a ton of equipment, but I'm actually going to switch you around to be this one. We need more manpower and anti-tank. Anti-tank is going to be a problem. At least our southern border is not going to be too much of a problem. Octobi, huh? Very good. And within two months, we'll have some more research done. After that, study the methods. Sometimes good qualities endure in a man regardless of his incorrect allegiance. Rokosovsky's officers embody this fact despite their weak moral fiber. They've taken after their late master in the field of strategy and tactics. I will go to war with them immediately. <clears throat> There's much that our own officers can learn there, even if such knowledge needs to be adjusted a little to suit our own doctrines. We shall go digging down through archives through Rokosovsky's own writings and see what there is to find. The captured officers have been fairly uncooperative so far, but we might learn at least something by putting the screws to them before they expire. Anything that can come that can hone the motherland sword is most, most welcome. All right, so let's stop training. We gotta get as much organization as possible, actually. So I can't imagine these guys are going to be super, super tough, but I could be very, very wrong. And oh, there goes those guys. Twenty-seven thousand manpower. Oh, they actually have a tank division. Oh crap, that's not good. Where's the tank? Oh, it's oh well, right by the capital. Go figure. All right, so they have a division division per tile. It appears. So let's send our guys in first. Maybe the tanks will attack us. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. We'll see what happens. Um, excuse me, sir. Please don't move. Wow, they really are stacking a lot of guys in there. All right, everyone. Good luck. Keep these guys in place. Come on, go in. Go, 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 go. Yes. Yes. You are going to hold. I don't care what happens. You've got to hold, 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 hold. For the love of God. Oh, the cap is all the way up there now, huh? That sucks. Nice. Once... Once this tank division is done, there will three divisions to spare. We'll core teal men or whatever it was. Train new recruits. 35 political power. Uh, sure, why not? Even the tank division can still be beat? Where are they going? What? They're not just going to actually die? Are you kidding me? Son. Force it. Bormen wins the German Civil War. Very good. Alright, they're gone. Not bad, my friends. Not bad. Uh, we could lose stability for this. And I'll do it anyways. I, I don't know if we need to keep doing that or not. Sensing descent. Let's go do that too. And we're almost done with that, which is good. Well, not bad. 
study their designs. Follow up with, oh, actually, I'm gonna do it like this. Take over their design bureau. Rokosovsky had at least had the foresight to prepare for his own inevitable demise, and Sverdlovsk there stands a new and clearly well-defined, or well-funded, R&D facility that was apparently carrying out a variety of interesting and innovative projects prior to the conquest of the city. Now that it is in our hands, we can put it to far better use than a clique of self aggrandizing officers ever could. The scientists and engineers, often spying civilians that they are, have already accepted the Black League authority and put themselves at our disposal. This is most pleasing to Yazov and a welcome development, but some of the more problematic elements may need to be replaced. Good. The report BPOSAB7R. <clears throat> Background. Dissident political elements 67K, apprehended subsequent to the occupation of SL22A, Sverdlovsk, following total collapse of the Ural District military capability. 67 subjected to level 3 AF interrogation and pursuit of actionable intelligence on additional dissident elements. <clears throat> following interrogation, 67K identified as requiring immediate processing. Summary 67K brought before the combined tribunal 445F8. Council provided. Trial duration, 17 minutes, 20 seconds. <clears throat> Sentence, death, no final statement. From 67K, likely owning or owing to after effects of interrogation. Immediate execution of sentence remains disposed as of protocol B564P. Addendum. Dissident element 68K, Betov Pavel Ivanovich, not apprehended upon occupation of SO22A. 68K is suspected to have evaded capture alongside our other dissident elements. Future insurgency considered possible. Report ends. Filed in section... F-E-A-F-156, access restricted. Nice. And actually, before we do anything else, uh, the Old Republic Crush. Slightly decreased scoring time. Sweep the rest. Free aviators. Where do we go? Who do we go to war with next? Uh, the war plan. Solvency. Yugra. Zataust. A higher cost. So wait, are we so... Um, we're part of this group here. So you guys are this part of this group, and then we're over here. Okay, so we just have to go up this way. Okay. That's not bad. I'm not really sure which one we're going to take out, so... Maybe Yugra next. Let's see. It looks like we got some time to do this. So I get lay on the cot in his cell, trying to sleep. <clears throat> it was no use. His head pounded and his body ached. He only jumped or slept for a few hours at a time. The screams ringing out from deeper in the prison woke him up every night. How have they done it? They were madmen, cultists. How could they have defeated the, th the third army? How did they do it? The question rattled around in Sergei's head day in and day out, even though it wouldn't make any difference. The light was out. The last bastion had been conquered, and now hope rode with Betov and his warband, no matter how shriveled that hope had become. He was still clinging in the squeal of old hinges, and footsteps pounding towards his cell. His heart smashed against his ribcage. An officer with a new nose like the prow of a boat stopped in front of his cell. Sergei Babrov, he said flatly. Yes, sir, uh, Sergei replied, his voice cracking from underuse. Was it time, finally, time for his punishment? The officer pulled an envelope from his breast pocket and slipped it through the bars of Sergei's cell. It floated to the ground. Let's say it is from Field Marshal Yazov. He addressed it specifically to you. You will have your response prepared by this time tomorrow. The officer, officer turned and left. Sergei snatched up the letter. His whole body shaking, his eyes slicked from line to line, catching bits and pieces of phrases he expected a letter from like this. Betrayal of the Russian nation, obeying traitorous sup superiors, displayed talent and bravery in the field, and so on. Out of habit, he looked at the final line. His jaw dropped. He sat down on his cot, the letter in his trembling hands, and read the final line over and over again, trying to make it sense out of it. You will have a chance of redemption through service to Russia and the Black League. Service begets blood, and blood begets redemption. Okay, so earlier we did that, like, you know, there was no peace or no, like, pure something in our focus tree. Oh, let's go this way now. Organic units has to be nice. <clears throat> we had take the black or a pure league. Yeah. I don't know, maybe I should take in the black. That, would, that probably actually would make a little bit more sense for us just because of uh, how we're doing stuff. So, look at that manpower now. Oh, yeah. Nice. And we have stuff for everything here. Ooh. Let's do that. Let's do that, too. This should be good enough, so. There you go. I don't want to lower gun production because that would not be very good for us. The Old Republic Rush. Now that the Black League in Western Siberia is... Ha is holds Western Siberia in its grasp. The shame of the failed republic can finally be excised. Across the region, the hammer and sickle is being torn down, while portraits of Rokosovsky and Kaganovich are piled up and burned in their place. The black flag and a glav korovark are raised high, and that all the people of the Western Siberia might know who rules in perpetu perpetuity now. With this, the Black League finally has it upon its altar, which the motherland will rise as a phoenix from the ashes. Here, we shall begin the reforging of the Russian body, mine and soul, into a weapon with which to strike down the German abomination and forever entrench Russia's rightful place in the world. And this, of course, will slightly decrease scoring time, which is a very good thing. Hmm. Meh. Hmm. I'd rather hold on to the political power, because once we are on the regional stage, we can start investing in a lot more stuff. Happy 1965, though, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. At this point, I'm just going to rush down this, this land auction. I don't care about anything else too much. I want to rush it. Rush, rush, rush. 
We still can't build stuff. Are you kidding me? End of the South African War. Good job, guys. Look at all the stuff we can build now. Oh, and resources, too. Actually, look at all the resources we have. All we're missing is rubber now, which is awesome. Oh, look at this. Yeah, schools, equipment. And then agricultural stuff, because that stuff is really good. Can I raid somebody else, please? Oh, there goes Denmark. Bowman won the war, so... Good job, Bowman. And... Let's see, it was... This one. Efficient supply lines. The state of the infrastructure in Western Siberia is beyond wretched. Or wretched. It never saw the benefits of Bukharin's Siberian plan like the central region did. Many of the roads and railways crisscrossing the regions go back to days of the Tsars. Constant German bombings did little to improve the situation, for, nor, for that matter, did the incompetence of our enemies. Thankfully, the Glavkovic has a plan. We don't need the grandiose extensive excess, ex, uh, excess? No. excessive construction programs of the Bolsheviks. We need straight, solid highways and reliable rail lines. With no need for civilian transportation, the entirety of our infrastructure network shall be given over to the most practical, efficient means possible. Nice. Even more industrial equipment. Expertise is going up by 3.5, but this is going up by 7. Oh, good lord. Within 6... Uh, how many months? 8 months? Eight? No, nine. Probably more like nine months. We'll have it. Oh, good job. And the Bennett. The only thing I know about Bennett is he's Mormon. Which is, you know, fine, whatever. I assume he plays USA again. I really do want to. And you guys are 15 combat with, which is not bad. But, do we have another division? No, we don't. Uh, so what is this like? Anti tank is just looking real bad. That's the main thing here. If that's the case, you know what? Screw it. You guys are not bad. I'm going to make you 20 combo with anyway, so. It's going to cost a little bit more equipment, especially anti-tank, but actually, we'll, we'll probably have that. We don't have anti-air, which is totally fine. Whatever. Industrial subsidies? Um, yeah, it's not worth it right now. And then a new bureaucracy. Naturally, most of the civilian bureaucrats of Tiamen and Sverdlovsk survive our conquest, but that is of little benefit to us. Pencil posters are accustomed to taking politically expedient, expedient orders from the party and men for party men and self-serving generals aren't what we need to run our new ideologically pure bureaucracy. New administrators and clerks will need to be evaluated, preferably those with no ties to previous regimes. There are plenty of men unfit for service we can draw upon, as well as women who are presently doing nothing else productive. They can serve the motherland by reorganizing their neglected Siberian lands into a form more conductive to our ends. Or they can make more babies. If they want to. If they want to. Disperse industry? Why not? We lose pr production efficiency retention, but we get more consumer goods, bomb vulnerability, and factory repair speed. Novosibirsk. Oh boy. One of Bukharin's gravest crimes was his utter failure to prepare Russia's industry for war. With so much of it concentrated in major cities, it was easy pickings for German bombers. Mere months after the beginning of the war, armor's production was so devastated that many soldiers were forced into battle with only a single rifle and five rounds between three men. But we know better. We know that, like the Black League itself, every facet of the Russian state must be as a many headed hydra. Concealing our industrial complexes underground is only half the solution. They must be dispersed, so that even if a complex is destroyed, there will be no collateral damage to the rest of our industrial bases. Prepared in this way, we shall never again find our ourselves helpless before the foe. I'm ready to go for more war. I want war, man. I am ready to unleash what some might say as heck on earth. Out with the old. And we do this one first. So, With the territories of two men and Sverdlovsk under our control now, we must begin reorganizing them in preparation for the great trial. Look at our manpower. 115,000. The first steps require the creation of a single unified bureaucracy where there was once an Two inefficient ones. The power-hungry apparatchiks and arrogant military officials will be replaced by valiant members of the Black League, who will lead the transformation of these areas into a s iron cogs and a war machine, as well as pass by any seditious elements with it with extreme prejudice. I love that. I love extreme prejudice. Where the previous administration failed, we will not only succeed, but excel. The new bureaucracy will serve the League in Russia from the bottom up. There will be League members in every town hall, every police station, every factory. They will collect every kopeck in taxes, deliver every parcel, and govern every oblast. Our control will be in total. It must be, or else Russia will never be prepared for the Great Trial. And in with the new, the ugly truth. A bad day to be Polish. Actually, someone did ask, uh, is there any content for Nova Polska? I still got to get through comments. We're only like 29 minutes in this video already. But yeah, they don't have any content yet. There will be eventually. I, I'm more than certain there will be, so. And after that, people are dying, but that's okay. Loyalty to Comrade Yazov. Yazov has a sole inheritor to General Karabyshev's legacy and represents everything that a Russian man should aspire to be. Strong, bold, cunning, ruthless, and 
zealous. He distinguishes himself from the common man by his willingness to sacrifice absolutely anything to further the revival of the motherland and her dream of vengeance against her hated oppressors. <clears throat> Those terrible, god-awful Germans. We all know these things to be true, and our new brethren must know them as well. The Glav Kovacs portrait must adorn every home, and his black banner must fly under every flagpole. Most importantly, those who question the new play of things must be thrown into the streets and put to death. Those who oppose Yazov and the League are no better than the disgusting Germans. We get more war support, and it gets more popularity of ultra-nationalism. Don't mind if we do. And there goes Nova Polska. Uh, not Nova Polska, but that Polska. Big sadness for them. Put an F in the chat, boys. Alright. Sweep the rest. Though the core lands of Western Siberia are secure, the fringes still lie outside the Black League's control. As a sole legitimate government of Russia, this is absolutely unacceptable. We shall begin moving to take these lands as soon as possible. There are four so-called states for us to account for. Slatos, the Free Aviators, Abandons of Yugra, and the Soviet Remnants, inhabiting Vorkuta. Each must fall and have their assets incorporated into the Black League before we begin looking beyond the Urals. Good. Our air support. Um... Actually, at this point, this doesn't really matter too much. Marines are okay. I'm not going to use it. It doesn't make any sense for us to use Marines, so air support them. <sighs> Love it. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Actually, you guys have that. And garrisons? Well, we definitely need military police. Because I don't mind using these guys for garrisons. Equi infantry equipment and support equipment. Because these guys require anti-tank, and I don't want to use any anti-tank, even though they're better suppression, technically. These guys are only half as good, but they don't require anti-tank, which is, in my mind, kind of important. The new boss. You have Genny woke up at 4.30 a.m., 30 minutes before his shift started. He followed his routine, he cursed at the time, pissed, cursed at the cold, dressed himself, re-wrapped his fingers in the last piece of gauze he had, made a cup of a dark, watery substance he was figured was meant to be coffee, drank it, and cursed the taste on his way out the door. When the bus stop was a short but frigid walk away, oh no, 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 the bus was late. When it finally arrived, he climbed on, climbed on and found a spot near the back. It felt like there was a brick in his stomach. Perhaps by silently begging it to go faster, the bus made it to the factory quicker than usual. It wasn't enough to make up for the lost time, although. It should have been a big deal. Fifteen minutes wasn't the end of the world. Mr. Simic dropped as he walked in. The assembly line stunk of cheap tobacco and grease. Two conveyor belts stretched across the room where they emptied fishened, uh, finished butt plates into cardboard boxes. Grigorovich, what the, what the bad word kept you? Good lord. You have get Yevgeny's boss, a tall, thin man who demanded to be called Nikolaevich. Nikolaevich appeared from the shadows and smacked him on the back of his head. Have you no sense to your duty to your nation, to your fellow Russians? Get to work. By the time the shift ended, fourteen hours later, Yevgeny was a sweaty, filthy, bleeding mess. The cuts on his fingers had opened again, staining his bandages red. Nikolaevich kicked him in the leg on his way out. Don't be late tomorrow, he growled. Yevgeny cowered and nodded. He limped to the bus stop, nearly missing it, and went home. Rinse and repeat. Now why is he here? This is not his fault. He's just doing what he must. Tactical support. And we're almost done with anti-tank, but it's, it's always something we got to work more on. So we're done with this stuff for now. Let's go back over here and grab some civilian construction 3, because maybe eventually we can build stuff up. See, we're not building anything, so it's a complete waste then. Complete waste. Battle Barcelona? Nice. Actually, oh, we already have a lot of stuff right there too, huh? You know, give me one more of this. That'd be nice. Sweep the rest. War plan. Uh, I want to go to war with War plan, Solovzy. Solovy. Thieves, whores, and gutter rats are all that reside in Ugra and scattered towns and villages. There is little worth in the area beyond the city of Ugorsk. And even that is questionable. Reigning over all is a sad excuse for the state led by known scoundrel Yaba Izolani. This rogue territory must be swiftly occupied and its inhabitants dealt with appropriately before their degenerate criminality spreads to our lands. We expect little resistance from the bandit army that watches half-heartedly over Ugra's borders. They are nothing but half- Press gang villagers and jumped up highwaymen playing at soldiers, and no match for the cadres of the Black League. Alright, men. You can stop doing that. And what do we have here? Anything down here? No. Nope, that's good. After that, an officer that can't refuse. Three aviators. Uh. War plan Sadko. We've benefited from the presence of Dragunov and his little republic. He was willing to sell us whatever military hardware we were required. Only with his weapons we were, were we able to keep up with our enemies and ensure that they had every man had a rifle in hand. And yet we cannot allow Zlatas to continue. It is not merely the fact that it is independent, but that is a problem. It is also a monument to greed, perfidy, and anti-Russian sentiment. Were dragging off a man of morals, he would kneel between the Glagoverk and offer the entirety of his arsenals in service to the Black League. As it is, he continues to defy our authority and desecrate the name of Russians everywhere with his avaricious, venal, venal, and plutocratic ways. We will crush this mockery of a state and give the merchants of death the punishment they deserve. Thank you for helping us before. And we'll do that one as soon as this is over as well. Now, it shouldn't be too bad. -y. Oh, wow. They have three divisions and 1,500 dead. As they should. So 
the three aviators. Hopefully we can get these guys under us with no problems. And then we can integrate these guys too, which would be kind of nice. Alright, where do we going to see that? It's probably right here. Reunification. And a little bit of lag. Ah, Pakistan. Interesting. No one cares right now, though. Sorry, Pakistan. But no one really cares. Maybe later. Maybe... When is Pakistan going to get a unique focus tree? Hmm? That's my question. Oh, God. Don't think we've got to go all the way up there. Alright, you guys just go, 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 go. Well, we've killed off a division, at least, so far. We've lost 200 guys, so that's not too bad. Go, 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 go. He's really good on attack. I like that. Skill 5 is pretty good. But this is getting more political power for later on. That's nice. So we can help out our poverty rate. And Seklahard as ours. War plan side kill. Immediately. And integrate them. Thank you. Anything else here? Nope. Alright. Now these guys probably won't be as easy to take out. Oh, hello. Thank you. Ah, uh, the Ragnarok. He's looking kind of chunky there. The Merchant of Death, eh? Kind of chunky. Oh, he's got up to... Eh, we're equal almost in terms of divisions, but an offer they can't refuse. How about we press them into service first, though? The criminals and unpatriotic peasants who dwell in the Uyghur rightfully deserve to be punished, but we have gained so little from the recent campaign that it seems a waste to just shoot them all. Many of them are fit and able-bodied, even if they've never done an honest days of work for the motherland. Their redemptionary brigades could use some fresh meat. Strong backs are always needed to break stones, chop woods, and till the fields with no records on hand. To know the exact crimes of our captives, forcing them to redeem themselves through labor seems the most appropriate and logical solution. Can we go in? And do a good job? Maybe, maybe not. Better industrial equipment. Uh, you know what? This happens every campaign. So if you'd like to read about better industrial equipment, go right ahead, but I'm not going to read it for this for now. So, it is what it is. Oh, yes. That'd be good. Anything else down there? Nope. Anything over here? Silence Descent. Do I really need to do this anymore? I really don't want to spend any more time on this. Uh, he's now full command. Uh, do I need to keep doing this or not? Screw it. I'll do it anyways, just in case. I'm a little uh, apprehensive about it. Force it. Screw it. Force it. Force them to die. Die, die, die. Or die yourself. That's pretty much how it works here, so. Fighters. We'll use whatever we have at our disposal to win. And that may or may not include tactical bombers. Alright, there we go. Doesn't matter. Either win or die. You are really disappointing me right now, aren't you? This general is. Oh my goodness. Force it. I don't care. You're going to win or die. The motherland demands it. So they're doing last stand too. Look at that. They are definitely doing last last stand. Ah, the arms plan's been captured. The continued advance of our troops deep into the Urals has resulted in the capture of a great prize, the famed La Taust arms plant. Long known for the turning out of vast quantities of high quality small arms and ammo. The capture of the plant means that we can now secure these weapons for ourselves while simultaneously denying them to our enemies. Already our engineers and administrators are working to integrate the plant's operations into a wider logistical network, and thus this should be completed shortly. Although it is in truth only one large factory complex of which we already possess many, it will not go on its own to produce a decisive amount of material. The value of the plant should not be underestimated. It is a symbol of Russian arms production and it now belongs to us. It is yet one more jewel in our crown, and we will leverage the economic, combative, and political advantages it promises to facilitate further advances and conquests until such a time as all the lands and peoples of Russia acknowledge our state as triumphant forward. Good. You have nowhere to go. We have lost about... A oh, we killed off more than they killed of us, which is actually pretty good. For now. Like, seriously, either win or die. That is your... That's all you have. Oh, Indonesia war. Oh, cool. You go to prison city. We have so, so many undesirables in our nation. With a recent influx from Yugodov, we're soon going to have to start shooting people for even minor infractions simply to keep our prisons and the redemptionary brigades from getting over full. At least that's what we feared. Yazov has always has the answer. The city of Yugorsk is of little value strategically, and doesn't have much in the way of industry, but its small size and isolated location makes it easy to control. With lots of wire fences, put checkpoints on every road, and have pay patrols active around the clock, and make an ideal open air prison. Escapees with a little hope for survival in the Arctic wilderness. Once they are trapped, who cares what they get up to? All right, you're gonna, you're done. You're done. I'm you know, I'm, I'm half tempted to let you just die, because you have failed the motherland. You have absolutely failed them repeatedly, and we will not tolerate ins insolence. 
failure is not an option for the motherland. Absolutely not. I'd rather lose divisions than let you lose a battle. No, you're not done. You're not done. You're going to keep going in, 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 in until you either kill them or you die. They're not, not one step back. 20,000 loss? I don't care. Doesn't matter to me. Does not matter. Okay, seriously, where's their capital now? How are they not dead? They should be completely out of manpower by now, though. Nope, they sell 3,000 somehow. Oh well. Force it. Force them to die. Force, 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 force. And. Yeah, you know what? We'll crack, about, crack open the armies. Our scouts have reported incredible sets in Zatas and Zini Tagel. Great warehouse, w warehouse is filled to bursting with rifles, artillery pieces, trucks, and lock rocket launchers, and all manner of non combat equipment. Dragonon could have, har could have armed half the population of Omsk, but instead he hoarded this wealthy or wealth of proper weaponry away from his own profit. Well, the Black League is no band of money grabbing merchants, and Yazov is no oligarch masquerading as a politician. We shall strip the cities of the former Republic bare until every bullet is accounted for and placed in the hands of the trained and capable soldiers of the cadres. Weapons should be on the battlefield, not gathering dust in a depot. That's great from Yugorsk. Are you, who said you were done? Who said you were done? You are not done, and I will have these people shot if they're not done attacking. And force it. So, Roman stared down to the bottom of the bunk above him. The shiv in his hand refused to let him sleep. The two guards paced up and down the rows of bunkers, or bunks, their boots clicking on the wood floor while the places were, all the pieces were in place. The game ended tonight. He would die, or they would. His heart thrummed in anticipation, his breath caught when Igor stood up from his bunk at the other end of the lodge. Just as planned, the guard on that end sneered at Igor and drew his gun, Roman gripped his shiv. The Romans, Roman slid out of the bed and threw all of his weight onto the second guard. Roman wrestled him with him for a few seconds before he plunged the shiv into the guard's neck and held him down until he stopped moving. His, he stood, his legs weak. The other guard was a bloody pulp on the ground by the time he hobbled over. Igor grabbed the keys and started on the lock. Roman looked around at the other prisoners. You are free now. Go run. Die as free men. The marshal is with you, Roman said before he and Igor st slept outside. Makar's lodge was down the road. He waited outside, his pudgy face speckled with blood. We have to move. They will hunt us down. Quickly, now. They ran, scampering through the Rakuta log like rats. Alarms blared all around. Bare feet pounded on gravel. Guards shouted. The hole in the fence was just up ahead. Dogs barked. Gunshots from everywhere and nowhere. Makar pushed Igor aside and dove for the hole. Roman looked around. Flash. He was blind. The searchlight was on them. The loudspeaker screeched in fury. Makar blubbered. The hole was too small for them. Too small for any of them. The game was over. Roman's heart sank. The guards in the tower opened fire and cut the three of them down in less than a second. No one escapes the league. Not a single person. Come on, soldiers. Win or die. I don't care about the... I really don't care about the casualty rate. These are disappointing soldiers to the motherland. And obviously, with their removal, which is it's totally fine. They are too weak to do anything. Absolutely too weak. You attack... Okay, we're going to attack you then, too. This is pathetic. This is absolutely 100% pathetic of these soldiers. They dare to call themselves soldiers? I don't think so. I really don't think so. These soldiers should be ashamed of themselves. We've lost way too many men to the garbage nation as the Taust. How are they still alive? No, you're not done. You're going to keep attacking until we win here. I don't care what it takes. I really don't care what it takes. I don't care if we have to kill off all of the manpower reserves. String them up. String all those soldiers up and kill every single one of them. There's no redemptionary brigades for these folks. Every single one of them are going to die. At this point, we got to make ourselves thicker. There we go. Good. Crack open the armies. That'll be good. And now we have no equipment, probably. Eh, I got enough guns though. Artillery and anti tank. Well, so be it. Where's Dragonoff? I want his body hanging for everyone to see. Pathetic. Pathetic soldiers that died. No. Not too much other things here. It's fine, whatever. 
Uh, Caesar assets. Zotalus was not just a merchant republic, it was an also an industrial hub. Zotalus Arms Plan is the most famous of these assets, but there are dozens of arms factories, uh, uh, producing everything from AKs to howitzers scattered throughout the foothills of the Ural Mountains. As with all industry in our nation, arms production is essential, and therefore these factories fall under the sole jurisdiction of the Black League. The corrupt plutocrats who run them will be turfed out and sentenced to serve in the redemptionary brigades, while the workforce shall be re-educated and then put back to work producing arms for the cadres. With this industrial center secured, our military supremacy is all but assured. Well, everyone, we are doing an offer they cannot refuse. The free aviators have our respect. Despite failing to recognize our authority, they have worked tirelessly to destroy the German bombers, raining ruin upon our people. No doubt themselves, or thousands of German airmen have plummeted, screaming to a fiery death, owing to the ferocity of the free aviators. However, no part of Russia can lawfully remain independent of the League, nor can we tolerate the existence of rival governments of any kind. An ultimatum must be sent to the free aviators as soon as possible to demand their immediate surrender. They have little more than a ragtag militia to defend themselves. If to refuse this would be madness, and they know it. This is their moment of truth. Are they loyal to communism's law? or to the one true Russian state. And even though now we're quite down on manpower, it doesn't matter to me, but between losing quite a few men to Zlatos because, well, we need to purge the weakness within our lands and reforming our soldiers to be stronger and bigger, we will prosper. League Wings, now that the aviator's territory is in our hands, we have, that. We have the rarest of assets in modern Russia, Air Force, to be sure. It is not so impressive at the moment, and consists of a motley assortment of aircraft of the 40s and 50s vintage, with a decent few jets donated by foreign sponsors. However, a few dozen aircraft is more than most self-proclaimed warlords can muster, and their pre mere presence lends legitimacy and prestige to our nation. More importantly, we can finally strike our enemies in the same manner that the Germans have been striking us for years. The aviators had a sizable airfield as their base, and the planes have enough range to strike out far beyond our current borders. The basis for the aerial cadres now exists. Time for us to put it to good use. The aviators, of course, accept. The free aviators have wisely chosen to serve the one true Russian state. They have accepted all of our demands. Our garrisons are moving in to secure the area and pacify any resistance, and already the night witches are being re reorganized to fit the, the, with the League command structure. Their unparalleled expertise and renown will no doubt at least be useful in the future. Good. As it should be. And let's go ahead and integrate them as well. Zataust. Hmm. Zataust, Zataust, Zataust. Ah, Vorkuta. Is that, are they next? They might be. I don't know. Go and train them, man. You're going to need it, because we have quite a deficit of stuff. Artillery, anti-tank, hmm, not great. War plan, Koshil. In the frigid north, gosh darn souls toil away in the old gulags forever being punished on the behalf of a government that no longer exists. Watching over them is the remnants of the Soviet prison system and the NKVD. Ghosts of the old order, trapped in the frozen, same frozen heck as their charges. Purely of their own volition. They are dead men walking, but they defy us all the same and must be subjugated. Access to the Arctic Sea is, a, is of questionable value to us, but the gulags might be of some use. The NKVD is also likely to retain many useful records, and the men themselves might also serve us well once their military wing is broken and the commander consigned to a shallow grave. Very good. From the gulags to training camps. Ooh, advanced training. That's not bad. More pro army professionalism? Yes, please. The gulags are honestly of little use as prisons. We have Ugorsk and the Redemptionary Brigades, after all. However, they're still isolated, well-supplied fortresses in a hostile climate, perfect as training facilities for the cadres. Nowhere else in Russia can a man experience the worst punishments that the motherland is capable of inflicting upon her unruly children. So my question the wisdom of sending a soft-hearted young man to an old prison in the Arctic Circle, where the wind alone can freeze the blood in one's veins. We say Mother Russia made Brokutu to test her people. Who are we to question the wisdom of the motherland? In the North, boys might become heroes or monsters in equal measure, as indeed they must to succeed in the great trial. And we should be able to sweep through them pretty darn quickly, not gonna lie. And we can also finally start building, hopefully, civilian factories. It's going to take us until 1969, which honestly, that's a bit extreme in my mind. So instead, more roads. Roads to the max. We're gonna build roads, 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 roads. And currently we are barely getting any political power, which is whatever. That's all right, that'll definitely help us out. Let's grab some... Oh, should have done more of this stuff, too. More output? Yes, please. Oh, we have some... Oh, nice. Good. Get more artillery. Plane-wise, we're actually not looking too bad. Even more... Actually, we're going to max out artillery, because we're going to really need a lot of that where we're going. Uh, main battle tanks as well. Do something like that. And then APCs. There we go. Nice. There you go. Uh, I'm not even going to be bothered with it. This stuff is good stuff to get. Burgundy bunkers, we've lost no one, they've lost a thousand. As it should be. Uh, 
The reign of Yazov. Vorkuta gulags have been captured. As a man swept over the Arctic plains, the infamously dreadful Vorkuta gulags have become under administration. The dark complex of washed towers, gloomy barracks, and labor camps strike a trembling fear in these icy wastes. The unbelievable torture of this natural prison serves as a reminder of the wickedness of men. The enemy's men lay scattered across the courtyard, buried in debris, and torn to pieces by machine gun fire. With blood freshly painted on the dark brick walls, the smell of gunpowder was thick, and silence was after battle was deafening. We were in place of it, and of immense suffering, and whilst many of our men broke down doors to scurry in and rummage for loot, others lowered their weapons to gaze at the daunting sight that dwarfed them. With the gulags largely preserved from war, however, this does pose a question. Are we to close the site down forever and later remain a relic of our barbarous past, or must we plunge our hands in the dirty realities of this wall so that Russia may live on? Sometimes great men must do awful, awful things. So be it. So be it. Very good. Post that. Solidify control. Uh, actually, let's go ahead and try to integrate them first before I read anything else. There we go. Not bad. Pretty good, I would say. Solidify control, though. The far north is not an easy place to rule. Though there's no word of rebellions, the distances between settlements are vast and communication is spotty on the best of days. Patrols can simply vanish during a blizzard. Frozen in the uniforms, are buried to the necks in snow. Only the motherland knows how many of her children lie beneath her frigid mantle so after so many centuries. Yet, rule it we must. The North might not seem important now, but it will play an important role in the future. When the time comes for a collective judgment, the North is our punishment, but it will also serve to prove to be our salvation in time. Which is very, very good. And we do have a cup of coffee here, too. Keep us nice and warm in the cold, frigid North. Train. You must train every single time. To be prepared. Integrate NKVD, but the icy hot. Genelidi Vladivirovich Voryovyov was frozen. His eyes, tongue, teeth, skin, testicles, heart, all of it was stiff and cold. Lifeless. And soon his brain would join them and he would be dead. But he would also be free from Rokuto. He couldn't wait. He charged through the endless icy snow, rifle in hand. He shivered and pulled his thin overcoat tight to his body, shifting his backpack from one shoulder to the other. The wind stabbed at him like a niven, driven nail. None of what he was given was meant for weather like this. His coat and hat were too thin, and his boots were waterlogged. He felt naked. The exercise was simple. Make it back to Brokuto. The only problem was his numb fingers dropped the compass the first time he took it out. It shattered, and without that, his map was useless. So he started walking again in the vague direction of home that was one or two days ago. So was scarce above the Arctic Circle. He only got one or two, three hours of best. That left him with pain in the cold. A loose chunk of ice brought his boot out from under him. He brought his... He put his free hand to break out of the fall and landed hard on his arm, twisting his hand to the further, to the side further than nature would allow. Snap! An involuntary scream burst from his throat as he rolled back, rolled onto his back. Staggering to his feet, he glanced at the brown red stain spreading down his sleeve and kept walking. Between the pain, hammering his brain in his great heavy breaths, a realization dawned on him: no man could survive this. This was a calling. The weak would freeze and the strong would rise. He repeated that in his head as the black flesh in his extremities spread and the sun sank once again below the Arctic horizon. There will be no weakness in the league. As expected, the NKVD trapped in Brokuta had little interest in fighting and capitulated without too much struggle. They are men of questionable politics, having served Bukharin loyally, but their integrity is beyond reproach. They continued to follow their orders long after the ones who issued them was gone, and that was precisely what the Black League would have of all Russians. A general amnesty will be offered to the Vokut of NKVD with a single caveat. They shall accept service in the Internal Security Division for so long as they are needed. All crimes and previous affiliations will be forgotten. All they have to do is don the uniform of the Black Hand and wear it to the grave, such as the generosity of a Kovark, sole representative of the Motherland. And more encryption, reverse rate, damage to goes down. Not bad. I like that. Shadows over West Siberia. Now that the NKVD's assets are under control of the Black Ham, we can finally settle the last pressing matter we face, that of internal security. We've had plenty of successes, swaying the people of Western Siberia with both carrot and stick. Men will go a long way for extra rations, and there's rarely a complaint when the factory overseers are carrying assault rifles. But that's not enough. Who knows what treason lurks in the hearts of men? Who's to say that the same people who cheer on Yazov publicly don't curse him behind his back, plotting the return of Bolsheviks? Might there even be collaborators among us? Traitors to the Russian state and the people alike? The League cannot be certain, perhaps. This Black Hand can. We must never forget that it was the weakness of the Russians that allowed the Germans to defeat our eyes must remain ever open, no matter what horrors they hold. Absolution. The door opened and the hallway filled with light. Yakov squinted, but wheeled himself in as quickly as his trembling hands would allow. Yakov swallowed, wiped his nose, and faced the five members of the Redemption Board. <clears throat> the man in the center had a single red line and four stars on his epaulets. 
Yotov Ivanovich Kaprianov, conscripted into the 31st Redemptionary Service Battalion for the crimes of allying with the traitorous regime and withholding valuable materials from Black League members. Duration to serve to Russia, two years. Is this all correct? Yakov nodded, and the man made a note in his file. When he's done, he put his pen down. His eyes were like shiny black marbles under his peaked cap. He jabbed a finger at Yakov's wheelchair. How did you lose your legs? The Battle of Tobolsk. My battalion was ordered to clear a man on field. I see. Another note. Tell me, Yakov, do you believe that you've been redeemed? Yakov looked off into a space for a moment. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't. I don't even know what redemption means. How have I bled for Russia? Have I lost countless comrades in service of the motherland and the Black League? Have I given Russia everything I've had? We both know the answer to that question. He mustered what courage he had left and met the captain's eyes, but only you know what redemption means, so you tell me. The other members of the board shared looks. The captain glanced to his left, then his right, before leaping through the file laid out in front of him until he found the document with Yakov's mugshot. Welcome to the Black League. Sorry, I'm talking a little bit fast. No, Speed, speed, speed. Uh, very, very good. And this is... Wow, a week left. Oh, I should have let things go on a lot faster than that. Our authority secured. Slightly decreased coin time. And 100 more political power would be very nice, because right now, we get literally almost none. It's almost none. Ridiculous. And are we going to get another event, maybe? Maybe not? Well, from Omsk to the Urals, from Tiumen to Vorkuta, we ascend. Forged from a scattering of soldiers with nothing more than a fervent patriotism and grief for the fallen motherland. The Black League is now the de facto authority in Western Siberia. No longer are we simply called a band of madmen inhabiting a bombed out city, now we are contenders. Of course, what the rest of the world thinks is irrelevant. Beyond Russia, there's only two there are only German scum, backstabbing Japanese, and traitors who allowed a great nation to perish twice over. What matters is what we know in our hearts. That this is a but the first step towards the end of people's of Russia's nightmare. Towards dawn for our people, and towards the glorious bloody day of wrath for Germany. And the subhuman savages who call it home. Which is pretty good for us. For whom the bell tolls, Casimir tooted and scratched another name off of his list as he heard the familiar rumble of a gurney being pushed down the hallway behind him. Right on cue, Maxime and Luca rounded the corner into the makeshift reception area that the ISD has set up to an, in an old medical clinic, as expected. Between them, on a gurney, lay the body of one Oleg Petrovich. Though the only way one could recognize a man's identity anymore was by the toe tag someone attached to him. That took a while, Casimir observed. Did you get anything during all that screaming? Maxim grunted and shook his head. Well, Luca took a moment to light up a Makorka cigarette. Ah, for goodness sakes, fine, dump it and go grab another one. He looked down at the list, tapping his pen thoughtfully. Hmm, try... Mitrofan Mikhailovich. That kid we caught near Kurgan. The pair nodded and suddenly rolled away the latest unfortunate to die under inter interrogation. When they returned five minutes later, the ISD officers were carrying a young man in a soiled red armor uniform between them. A vicious red welded form under his temple where someone had struck him to stop his struggling. This him, sir? asked Luca, spitting away the end of a cigarette. Casimir ran a finger down the list to find the name again, glancing to, as a captive to see if the description fit. 17, 18, red hair, narrow jaw, corporal stripes. Yep, that's probably him. He jerked his head in the direction of the interview rooms. All right, back to it. The officers moved towards the hallway, but Maxime stopped aside Casimir's desk, looking thoughtfully for a moment. The senior officer glanced up at his subordinate with a frown. Problem, Sergeant? He asked. Maxime shook his head. No, sir. Sorry, I was just thinking. We need new drill bits. The last guy's rebs blended our last one. Can you put a requisition in for us? Casimir nodded curtly, and with that... His subordinates set off down the hall to torture a teenager to death for the information he didn't have. 20 in a day? A new record! Good, I love new records. And we're done with our land doctrine. And with more pronouns done here too, more industrial equipment, don't mind if we do. Oh, we don't have enough political power now. We can't even do this stuff too, which really sucks. Oh well. Hopefully no, we don't get cooed. But look at this. Liberal democracy. Conservative democracy. Authoritarian democracy. And loyalist Karabysheva. Not bad, my friends. Not bad whatsoever. And a triumphant league. Not so long ago, <clears throat> Comrade Karbyshev's dream seemed like an aspiration his law could never fulfill. In the wake of the old general's death, fate had conspired against his successor. A conspiracy of traitors sought to usurp him, Bolsheviks, merchants, and criminals defy his mandate, partisans still plagued the rightful government. But none of these things were a hindrance to the determined. In Yazov, the Black League had its mil Menelaus, a relentless pursuer of vengeance, possessed of an iron will and willing to pay any price for the salvation of which he loved the most. However, Yazov knew in his heart that his mission to fulfill the sacred destiny of Russia would never get any easier. There was an, always another false claim to the epithet of legitimate government. It was in the nature of the League to never be understood by lesser men. Even come the great trial, Russia would still be crawling under with turncoats and faint-hearted pacifists who refused to see the purity of Belarus' fate. There's only one answer. An iron boot, perpetually grinding them into dirt, where its where it conducted the symphony of war. For today, Yazov had his triumph, but tomorrow? Tomorrow would come the day of blood. No matter how many gallons he had to spell, Russia would pay the price for its future. It will end some day. So just in case, let us form the West Siberian Provisional Authority. 
and get another research slot. Now, we will have an overextended administration. The Black League unifies West Siberia. We now get 0.72 every day, which is not bad. And we have 142 political power, which I will immediately go ahead and do this, as well as equipment would probably be really good. Anything else here? Ooh, that's not bad. Mm, propaganda campaigns. I would like more stability. I'm done lowering my stability since we can't do it anymore, which is good. Uh, armor, armor professionalism. And weekly manpower would not be bad. Weekly stability, though, that's what we're going to do. And... 65, military factors, grab some industry. And what do you want to do? Poverty rates, so the State Development Directorate. The two decades of anarchy that followed the failure of the first trial have not been kind to West Siberia. Once a promising new frontier of industry, the region has become a battleground depleted by years of raiding and warfare. The Black League has stamped out the five dumbs of traitors and cowards that reclaimed the region, but those victories only mark the beginning of a different kind of struggle. Western Siberia must be rebuilt and its industry expanded to meet the League's needs. The research and academic centers under our control will need to be improved and centralized if Russia has any hope of escaping the, from the dark age it was thrown into. The Glavkorvark has ordered the creation of a new State Department Directorate or State Development Directorate, <clears throat> a new branch for our central government that will be responsible for both of these tasks. The legal requirement retool the factories of Siberia to produce weapons supplies for the con combat cadres. The scientific and educational institutions of our nation shall be brought into the modern day. Weakness and decay have ruled Russia for too long. It's time to start building again, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we shall prepare ourselves for more war. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.